commend the law firms uh, who we are recognizing today for raising the bar. Uh, without question, your commitment to providing a welcoming and fair and inclusive workplace for LGBT employees contributes greatly to the cause of equality. I have planned a slightly different speech presentation for you today. I talked to Brian and said, you know, what types of things would you like to talk about? He gave me, you know, gave me some uh, topics of the importance of diversity in the legal workplace, uh, the importance of diversity on the bench, and all of those things are great topics. Um, but I felt like I would be preaching to the choir. <laughs> because the reason we're here is because we already know that. And then I thought about, uh, I began thinking again and thinking back. And it occurred to me um, that although one of the things I don't like to do much is talk about myself. But I did want to talk about my personal experience because uh, for me, what you do, what these law firms do, and the fact that the fact that you are champions for equality, you are champions for LGBT inclusion, uh, is so very important because of what I didn't have. Now, I was born and raised in East St. Louis, Illinois, and many of them, all those five hours on the opposite side of the state. You guys are in the East St. Louis, Illinois. And then, of course, I went to college and I went to uh, law school at Vanderbilt, came back home to practice law. And when I began my practice of law in 1987, um, diversity in law firms, in courts, and in the legal in, uh, profession in general simply did not exist. I mean, let's admit something. Uh, the legal profession is a very noble, it is a very noble uh, profession, but it is still a very conservative profession. And back then in 1987, uh, that was really the case. Uh, so there was not much in terms of diversity, whether it's with respect to ethnic and, race and racial um, identity or uh, there wasn't diversity in terms of women in the law and certainly there wasn't diversity in uh, with respect to members of the LGBT community and perhaps that has something to do with where I am. I will admit there is a little difference between the north northern part of the state and the southern part of the state. But again, <laughs> in 1987 I don't think that there that was that much of a difference. And of course, because I was lucky and blessed enough to have uh, been born such that I checked all of the boxes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Suffice it to say that at that point, our profession simply didn't feel very welcome to me. Uh, there were no, no such thing as firms or courts and agencies that had equal opportunity and non-discrimination policies. That simply did not exist. And for and so for many years, uh, as I evolved personally to uh, accept, embrace, and, and yes, celebrate my authentic self, I lived a conflict. I didn't have the ability to, to do that professionally. I lived the don't ask, don't tell existence. And I did that, frankly, to survive professionally, I thought. Now I see a lot of young people in the room, and I know, and we are all thankful that for most of you, this is not your story. But I see a lot of not so young people. <laughs> and so I would suspect that some of you can identify with this experience. And it was a bit schizophrenic. Uh, and so professionally, 
Um, there were certain opportunities that existed that admittedly I didn't consider or didn't pursue. Because for many years, my first thought was, is it going to come up? And how is it going to play? There were certain firm and professional activities that I did not engage in. After so many years of going to the holiday parties and the firm cookouts alone, um, because I, I didn't, you know, I wouldn't show up, I didn't hire the date. <laughs> and so, you know, after many years, it's, you know, pretty obvious. But the good news is, um, as time went on, and frankly, as I um, became more comfortable in my skin, uh, but things also began to change a little bit in terms of uh, public opinion, public acceptance, and, but I think it was much more that it just became a point when, you know, um, I changed and I evolved. And I became out uh, to uh, my uh, firm partners um, and things were different until I decided to apply for this federal judgeship. Now, frankly, let me just say that um, in 2012, when, when the two vacancies in our district came open and they were accept, accepting applications, at that point in time, um, if I would have backed it up three to four years, maybe even five years, if I'm being honest with myself, I'm not so sure whether or not I would have pursued it because I think I would have been concerned. Uh, we have to look at the political climate at the time and where we were and where we weren't, if we're being honest. Um, but perhaps I would have taken on the fight anyway. But I will say, when I made the decision, to apply for uh, the position is not something I had planned for, and, and all of you know as, as judges, you know, a uh, federal judge is not something you can put on your career track. <laughs> <laughs> I have all students ask me all the time, judge, if, you know, if, if you're interested in being a federal judge, <coughs> what are the things you should do? How can you prepare yourself? How can you uh, go along that path? And I, and I tell them honestly, you know, it's about so many things that you don't have control over and you just have to be actually a little lucky and a little blessed. Uh, and so at the time when these positions came open, I wasn't really thinking about it. I had some folks call me and encourage me to say, hey, you know, I think about applying for these vacancies. And I'm like, hey, uh, <laughs> first of all, I actually enjoyed what I was doing as a die hard, and I know, I know many of you in this room would appreciate this, a die hard plaintiff's personal injury trial lawyer. Uh, and so I wasn't really thinking about it. But I considered it and, and after and, and weighed the different factors out and I made the decision to apply. Now, when I made the decision to apply, I knew I would be applying for a position that many folks would be applying for, and I understood that I had to get through first. Uh, the screening committee had to want to interview me, and then if I interviewed, I had to get to some level at some point, get to the point where uh, Senator Durbin would recommend me, and if, boy, if that happened, then I had to get to the point of all the paperwork, and then somehow uh, meeting with the White House staff, and, and going through the initial stage of vetting and hoping that I made it through that and the background checks and then, oh, what if the president wanted to nominate me? Okay, there you go. So all of these things <laughs> at that point were not really realistic to me, but I put in a 
put my name in the hat. And lo and behold, I made it through somehow all of these different levels. And when I made it to the point of um, meeting with Senator Durbin in his office, um, and then being told I was one of the final three people being considered um, before and right before the president, uh, or I guess at the time he was making the, the decision, but right before he was going to announce the nomination a couple of days before, I received a call and said, now, I believe the president's going to nominate you, and it can happen in, in any time in the next day or so. But we want to make sure that you're comfortable because, you know, when we make the announcement, we intend to uh, mention your orientation. And um, are you okay with that? And I said, I live it every day. Sure, I'm okay with that. By that time, I had come a long way from 1987, and I was real comfortable in my skin and real confident. And, you know, I was like, sure, well, I mean, that's who I am. No big deal. I've been honest with you guys in the process. Uh, you haven't kicked me out yet, surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, no big deal. And so on the day the president nominated me, I actually was in the hearing all morning in St. Clair County, Illinois. And I came out that afternoon. I had my phone turned off. I came out that afternoon, turned my phone back on, and it was, as they say, blowing up. <laughs> and I, uh, I'm looking at it, and people are texting me and saying, you know, congratulations, and I'm like, what happened? You know, and I, I really wasn't thinking about it. And then I was like, oh, really? They said, well, you know, the president, they announced that you were nominated today. I said, oh, really? And so, um, you know, I'm starting to look at stuff, and people are sending me things. And one of the... <laughs> One of the texts, uh, or one of the links that I got was for um, a story that appeared in the Huffington Post that day. And I'm looking at it like, why is it? And it, you know, I'm like, there was no picture, you know, no name, and all it said was, President Obama nominates black lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> Publications and, and first of all, I was shocked. I was like, "Why is this in the Huffington Post? You know, why is this in?" And it was in all these papers, nationally, globally, and they all had a very similar headline. And not once did I see my name. And then in the local media, they never mentioned my orientation. In the local media, I was, you know. Um, the attorney practicing from Old Fallon, Illinois. I was the Old Fallon, Illinois attorney. Nationally, I was the black lesbian. <laughs> and, you know, it, it, did, it took me aback a little. And then I talked to my mom. And I talked to, to, I began getting calls from other friends and supporters who were excited. But they felt a little way. And they were concerned and frankly a little not happy with that narrative. Because they said, well, wait a minute. What about your credentials? What about your qualifications? What does this have to do with you being black or a lesbian? You know, we don't understand this. And at that moment, I realized that I wasn't as ready for it as I thought I was. And I quickly figured out that there is a big difference between being openly gay and publicly gay. And that is what I had to get ready for. And so as I'm talking it through and processing it myself, first of all, I got back to the point was, I got back to the point where I said, 
really, it is really not a big deal because it is who I am. It's something I live every day. It's something I'm proud of. I'm not ashamed of it. And I thought about it, and I thought about the reason it was a national story. And the reason it was a national story, unfortunately, is because it was historic. And I say unfortunately is because unfortunately in 2014, I was the first openly gay, um, yeah, openly gay uh, judge in Seventh Circuit. I was only the second openly gay African American federal judge in the history. And so, while that was historic, I think it was unfortunate, but anyway, I came to the conclusion that I could deal with the narrative. I could deal with really not being referred to by my government name for the next <laughs> year and a half, <laughs> um, to the point where my staff at the law firm jokingly and uh, began to, they just referred to me as BL. <laughs> It was important that that happened because of the commitment that had been made to diversity by the president and by Senator Durbin, and they were walking the walk. And what I recognized and what I embraced, and I'm happy to say it is true, is if that had to be the story, if that had to be the narrative so that one, two, three, four, five years from then, now, three years from now, the next time someone from our community is nominated, is confirmed, and is appointed, it is not a story, I can do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I am happy to say that that is absolutely true. I do believe that in a very short period of time, well, depending on how certain things happen that I'm not supposed to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> and I, but I would not at all be shocked if we then have our first transgender fellow judge. And so I said that to say that just like my experience, the difference between being openly gay and publicly gay and the impact that it has is much the same for you folks with, this law, with, the, with these law firms. Your championing inclusion uh, is very, very important. And because of your commitment and the work that you do, the outreach you do, the mentoring that you do, the recruiting that you do, I mean, you guys walk the walk. Okay, and your partnership and work with organizations such as Equality America, I am very hopeful and very confident that because of what you do, unfortunately, you're going to have, five, have to find something else to be recognized for. <laughs> <laughs> because that work will no longer be a thing. Because it will just be as it is supposed to be. And I think that's a day that we all look forward to. It's a day that we will celebrate. But in the meantime, we commend you, we thank you, and you are to be lifted up. Thank you.